I manage a few pages on our on Facebook, so <laughs> just have to get to one, the correct one. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to have you with us here. We are um, going through our workshop Wednesdays here uh, through Dane Arts. Um, we are very proud to be part of Dane Arts, the Dabble Markets. And um, we are excited tonight to have with us uh, Ginger Ann. And um, Ginger Ann is going to be talking more tonight about uh, Excuse me as my things are moving around here on me. Um, we're, we're working through our technical difficulties today. So everyone bear with us. Uh, Ginger Ann is gonna be talking to us about science and art. And um, so we're really excited to learn more about that tonight. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna read Ginger Ann's uh, information here. Ginger Ann is the executive director of the Illuminating Discovery Hub. Uh, and we'll highlight the science of art and fusion work at the Wisconsin Institute of Discovery, or otherwise known as the WID, um, at the University of Madison. Science and art fusion works simply to, aim, uh, excuse me, works to aim to simplify st or STEAM, which I like with the A in there, um, access in under, underserved communities as a means to create social change, support the work art or support working artists and advance inclusive academic belonging. Principal initiatives to be discussed tonight would include science to street art, science to script, and co-writing, uh, co-grant writing. How can science art fusion lead to paid partnerships with local artists? This is really important. Uh, this workshop will provide information on WID programming and how artists can help tap into WID uh, in the WID frameworks and the strategies to support future collaborations through science and grants. Why science art fusion? Future STEAM advancements lies in diversity, but attracting and retaining diversity in science is, is often prevented by unconscious bias. Retaining diverse minds and the people and people still remains a challenge within both formal and informal science learning. Science art fusion and using a Jedi approach uh, challenges unconscious bias and compels community members to ask and answer questions. What does a leading scientist look, look like and how do they tell their story? Um, we're very excited to uh, have Ginger Ann with us and without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over. So Ginger Ann. Thank you so much, Megan, for that introduction. And I am going to do a screen share now. It'll take me a moment. I'm going to be juggling a couple screens here. So let me know when you're able to see this. Coming on. There you go. All right. Great. I'm going to juggle some screens here and then we'll get started. All right. How does that sizing look? Uh, it looks pretty good on my end. Great. Well, uh, thank you again. So just a little bit. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here tonight. I, I understand we are in a historic election process. So thank you for being here this evening. Um, although everyone is muted, it'd be great if you can put some put in the chat a little bit about yourself so I can get to know um, our participants tonight. Tell me a little bit about your art um, or your art profession and your interests within the arts or sciences so that when we're going through this, I'll be able to um, tailor some of the some of the conversation. And I'll um, start off here with telling you a little bit about myself as folks are uh, sharing in the chat bar as well. So uh, I have a picture here of when I was very little and I was telling my mom that I was going to go and dig up bones. So um, my interest is in bioarchaeology. I studied ancient remains and disease, but I also studied acting at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And so I was really interested um, both in the sciences and the arts, but it was, it was a hard challenge because a lot of times you were pushed to either choose one or the other um, or told you needed to focus on one. And so there was not a lot of support for how you fuse the two. Um, one thing that I always talk about is that I 
excelled at my science through my art practice. Um, for example, I used movement practices to help with memorizing lines, and I actually took those skills from acting and used them for the rote memorization needed for the sciences, which uh, made for comedy when I was in uh, classes for exams and I was moving, <laughs> trying, to, uh, trying to think through a, a question. But I found that the two were natural and they fused together and they complemented and were actually supporting each other in a way and not so different as what we usually think. Um, so that's always been a, a huge passion of mine and it's kind of led me on this science art fusion path. Outside of work, I also serve on several boards and granting bodies. So I'm on the board of the directors of Maya, which is a new center that's coming out. It's um, the Madison Youth Art Center. Uh, I also work you know, in WID and I'm doing the science art fusion and really looking at how we're nucleating uh, a new way to support both scholarships. And then I also serve on the Madison Arts Commission. I'm the vice chair right now, and I've um, served on several different boards, including the um, NEA's grant review, um, done some work for the task force for the Madison Children's Museum. So I'm really focused as well um, outside of my, my, my job at WID at looking at how we can amplify arts and our artists within community and get paid opportunities for artists so that we're seeding um, seeding opportunities here where artists don't feel they have to go somewhere else in order to succeed. So that's something that I have a, a large passion about outside of my science art fusion work. A little bit about um, my experiences and why this is really important to me and where some of this science art fusion began is that um, it stems from my own experiences as a person of color um, in science courses. I was often um, the only person of color within the room. And so there's a level of desensitization that happens and you're having to focus on the work. Um, and it's also not taught necessarily um, through a cultural lens that, that I was raised in. So I felt that um, I had to often just focus on this work and then also apply my own culture in order to um, get the most out of, out of the work. Um, an example of that being my grandmother was a healer. She had no formal education. Um, she, had, she didn't go through kindergarten, but she was a healer that learned her practice from her, her grandmothers and her great grandmothers. I would consider that a STEM field. She was a healer and a lot of practices and doctors would actually come to learn from her, but she didn't have the opportunity to have formal learning and learn how to read or write, but she was considered an expert in her field. And she was taught through storytelling and how is this important for, you know, for community um, to, to understand how you're impacting the, you know, how you're impacting community instead of just the rote memorization. So for me, it was about how do we apply storytelling to science learning because that become, becomes really important for the work. And art is story. Art is a way that we can craft story, learn, engage, understand one another, um, find out more about ourselves and others. So it's really a great avenue and a powerhouse for how are we changing perceptions in our community and creating a better community and creating more opportunities for people. So that's the mindset that I come into when I'm talking about science art fusion. Um, and with that, I was raised by my mother and my only grandparent was my maternal grandmother who taught me these healing practices. So it's really a part of what I think of as my identity. Um, and then just as a note with all presentations, I just kind of cap here, you would have noticed that I, um, I have my name, it's Ginger Ann. My last name is Contreras, but I don't lead with my last name um, as a way to acknowledge my First Nation lineage. Um, the last name Contreras is, a, is from the Spanish language, which is a European in origin, um, and is a part of a Western cultural tool set that was used to erase First Nation histories and cultures and what we um, now call Central and South America. So for me, it's a way to acknowledge my First Nation ancestral roots, um, which are where my grandmother has her healing practices coming from. So moving on to our next slide to get a little bit deeper. Um, as Megan um, discussed, we're going to be talking about science art fusion, what that means in WID. We're going to be specifically highlighting science to street art and science to script, and then talking about opportunities for co-grant writing around science art fusion, as well as potential collaborations that can spark with scientists if you're interested in representing science within your art, um, or you have a set science idea, or you're thinking, you know, this is an area where I'd like some contracts in. We're going to talk a little bit about that. 
So just a little bit about what I do at WID. Um, so as mentioned, I'm the executive director of our Illuminating Discovery Hub. And the Illuminating Discovery Hub is the, the outreach arm of WID. So we're really looking at how are we taking research and information from the lab outside of the lab. So how are we bringing it to the people? So we're bringing science to the people and people to the science. So we're looking at ways of how are we engaging community equitably? So when we talk about JEDI, what that means is it's just equitable, diverse, and inclusive approaches. So that is what we're, we're aiming for when we're creating science or fusion works. And why it's a big deal is that often the experience that I had within the sciences where I was the only person of color, that happens a lot as you continue to advance within the sciences. There is not a lot of diversity within the sciences. So how do we start to create more of a welcoming environment um, for a community to engage and then also engaging their diversity of mind? Um, how can we have different ways of thinking about science, approaching science so that we can get new people in the room to discover? Because sometimes those traditional routes of doing science um, aren't gonna get you the discoveries you need unless you have a diverse group of people that are that are strengthened together, looking for those answers that we need for our future. So why this matters and what it means for a science art fusion. Um, so this is a couple images that I absolutely love um, and they're so important. I don't love what they're saying, but I love the, the art that went into um, specifically the diversity in children's book um, image and talking about, what, you know, really highlighting what this says. And so what this says is that um, with the Cooperative Children's Book Center, the School of Education did a study on the diversity of characters in 2018 for children's books. And what they saw is that within characters of children's books, storytelling, there was only 1% that were American Indian or First Nation, 5% Latinx, and then it goes on 7% Asian Pacific, 10% African American. The highest percents of who was leading a story was animals at 27% and then white characters at 50%. And this is really important because what it shows is that through storytelling um, and through our books, which is a fusion of art and um, a, a way of empowering different stories that it was sending a message of who is the center of a story, who can be the main character of a story. And then what that means then for young children is that it's modeling, am I the main character of my own story or not? And that can be either very empowering if you're seeing folks that look like you in a story, or it can be very disempowering if you're not seeing people that look like you in a story. This is reflective in many different areas of how science is told. Right here, I have a couple different graphs that are from the Gina Davis Institute when they did a study in 2018 looking at 10 years of films that focused on science and who was represented. I'm just going to bring up a couple um, percentages here, but what it did show is that there was 27.9% of STEM characters who are people of color. And when you're looking at the projected um, estimates of the US population, you have 53% being people of color. You're seeing that you're not, you know, we're not reflecting um, our own population and the people that could be leaders. And then also that people that are already leaders in the field, um, they're not getting represented. Same um, for women, women are often underrepresented within STEM characters. So this is uh, mass media and arts that are, you know, that are telling stories and how it impacts science. But it also shows a flip side of through, through arts and this fusion of science and art, how can we start to empower a different way of thinking about science, a different way of thinking about engaging within community and who can lead their own story? Um, and so with WID, we're coming at it from the science perspective, but it's a really important um, area to acknowledge. And so that brings me to this comic that is, I always get a hoot out of, um, gosh, I saw this when I was probably um, in high school. And so why it matters to science and art when we're talking about story and how art as a, in all its different forms is really telling different kinds of stories and different kinds of um, cultural or, or personal expression um, is that in our formal education system, both in the arts and sciences, we have this kind of typical classroom structure of how we're learning. And um, this, this one, um, comic here, we have, you know, this, this person saying for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, please climb that tree. And I don't know about you, I'd love to see in the chat, which, uh, which animal you guys would relate to, but I often felt like I was the penguin or the elephant. 
<laughs> where it wasn't quite um, adding up to the way that I learned best or the way that I would necessarily test best. And so you're having to learn the culture of the test to succeed versus not, you know, versus just the material. Um, so this is something that's really important to talk about. It also brings up why we're doing Science Art Fusion within WID, which is that Science Art Fusion is a way to turn education on its head of how are we talking about these really important um, aspects of belonging within um, our community, within our education system, and how do we start to teach differently and support different types of learning. Um, and that goes to our next slide here, which is I'm going to briefly talk about some of the work that we have here, because this is something that if you find there's an area you're interested in or that you think that there's an opportunity for collaboration, please reach out to me. We'll also have my email available because we are always looking to collaborate and I'm always looking at supporting artists. Um, so we're going to be talking about science to street art um, and science to script, which are at the two ends of this slide. So I'll just briefly go over, um, go over all of them, but I'll briefly touch on these since we'll go in more detail later. Science to script, the essence of it is that we're pairing um, writers with scientists to create opportunities to learn about science that you're interested in putting in your story for accurate science. Um, so we have different kinds of residencies that we'll talk about later, as well as opportunities to um, have panels where we bring in professionals from the arts and film industry and, how, and with the sciences and how we nucleate those conversations about science or fusion that's already happening. Um, science to street art is where we're pairing street artists and muralists with scientists to create science themed murals um, through create creative placemaking um, lenses that help with supporting informal science learning, as well as for um, teachers to be able to take it and incorporate it into their curriculum and then also invest in artists paid opportunities as well as just beautiful art within community um, that lasts. Exhibit discovery, although this is on hold because of COVID, is an exhibit area that we have within the discovery building for folks that have science art fusion works to be able to display them there. Um, so this is open to the public, um, and it's a great exhibit space that we just exhibit space that we just started um, rolling out last year, and we will look forward to continuing once we're able to gather. Um, the Kohler Fellows at WID is also um, in its first year of um, having a readjustment. And what the Kohler Fellows is, is a specific to graduate students within the university where we pair graduate students within the arts and humanities with graduate students from the sciences. And they create their own science art fusion projects. They have a stipend that they get and they also get a project um, budget with the goal that there'll be community events that are science art themed as well as potentially public art or permanent public art or temporary public art. Really, it's completely up to them of what they decide to do. Um, the Kohler Fellows are either a one year or two year program. Um, and we've already gotten some information from our Kohler Fellows where there may be some interest in them collaborating with other organizations or other artists. So this is a way that um, it, can other, it can plug into community as well through this project. And then we have um, what we have this little beaker with all these different um, alphabets that you'll see. And this is a project we're just rolling out, but we're um, focusing on how we can create meaningful short videos about the science that are um, produced from an artistic lens. Um, but it's scientists talking in um, other languages. So it's about communicating science, um, not just through our traditional English, but how are we being language inclusive in the way we're telling the story of science? Um, because we find that language is a way of how we see the world. And so um, if we're communicating science in different languages, we're also seeing science differently. Um, so this is a really great way to to highlight that. So what you see is that you have these, you know, sciences that are kind of visual storytelling and other kinds of artistic forms that are shaping and then science and storytelling of the traditional writer coming together and we're all focusing on how are we transforming the story of science in a way that leverages both the arts and the sciences in this work. And so with that, we have Science to Street Art. This is um, gonna be one of our focuses tonight. Um, and what we're really focusing on here is how are we utilizing creative placemaking, working with community to create meaningful art that is representative of the community and representative of science um, in a way that is 
a powerhouse for learning and also empowerment. Um, and we do this in a really organic way. We pair the scientists with the, with the artists and we connect community together. And the artists are leading this. The artists are deciding what that visual, you know, that aesthetic is gonna look like with community. They're using their craft and their leadership to shape what is the best way to do this and what is the way that I as the artist want to focus on this and then the scientists help with um, creating you know helping making sure that it's science accurate for the educational component and then we build different kinds of activities around it so we partner with this wisconsin science festival um, we also are working right now on a new platform of how we can have virtual place for for the murals because we weren't unfortunately able to have our unveiling events for the murals i'm going to show soon um, so we're looking at until we can do that and have physical gathering how can we have a virtual gathering space so we're partnering with um pbs wisconsin in order to create a, a, a new environment of how we can highlight these murals and have different kinds of activities that teach you about the science, but then also about the art. So how we can have folks learn about what is the art process, learn more about the artists, highlight the artists and the work that they're doing. Um, because one thing that I am very mindful of is that at the university and these projects, how can we help leverage artists so that this also leads to new opportunities and new potential paid work after this project is done? That's something that's really important to me. So with this, I'm gonna hopefully knock on wood, this is gonna work. I'm gonna share a different screen so we can just do a brief video here for you to see um, uh, some of our murals and the, it gives you a good idea of the size of them, so. Let me know if you see a Vimeo link come up. Sound good? Thumbs up? No, not yet. I still see this, the PDF. No video? Oh. Looks like oh, it's right. starting okay. to shift. Okay, it might just be taking a little bit. Uh, the beauty of technology. It's been uh, tr a tricky little beast today. <laughs> I can right. hear Once it. Once you guys see a video, okay, cool. I will play this and let's hope. I can hear it, but I can't see it. Oh. Okay. I think you might need to stop sh screen share and share new screen. Sure. sure, let's try that. Okay. Oops, that was, that was not it. <laughs> okay. There we go. Was... All right, does it, it sounds good. Good. All right, 
So that showed a, a couple of our murals that we've done and just the sheer size of them. These are rather, you know, these are rather large murals um, that go up from the, the bottom all the way to the, the ceiling of some of our buildings. I'm going to share back here our uh, slide so we can continue talking about these murals. So to go in a little detail about what you were seeing and some of the science behind it. So as discussed, we have our artists and scientists do workshops to kind of brainstorm what it is that um, their, their science murals are going to be. One of our scientist murals that was not in this video is our diversity scientist mural. This is the one mural that is within WID and it was done by um, an internationally recognized artist, Melanie Stimmel. And it was um, in collaboration with scientist Laura Knoll, who's from the Medical Microbiology and Immuno Immunology Department, and then David Lovelace, which is, um, who is in UW Geology Museum's research group. And the goal of this mural was how do we, you know, how do we represent scientists and start to tap scientists that often aren't recognized or folks that you wouldn't necessarily think of as scientists um, who, who were as a way to start to open how we're, how we're envisioning what a scientist looks like and who can be a scientist. Um, and so this was a mural that Melanie Stimmel is recognized for. Uh, she does street art. She had um, one of her one of her collaborators who is a graffiti artist work on the graffiti, some of the um, lettering designs that you see here. And um, it was a span throughout time of different, different scientists um, that are pinging different locations around the world as well as different time periods and how we represent that. I'll um, talk about a couple, but I'm gonna, I just wanna talk about one story that, that happened here. One of my colleagues who works in the, custo the custodial department of um, WID, when this mural came out, she was really excited to learn about Inez, um, who is holding a flower on, um, on the what would be your right side of the screen. And um, Inez started in her 50s, um, her research. So she, you know, she, she went into this field um, later on in life. And um, my colleague was so excited about that. She said, well, that for me means I can still go back to school. And so how art is a huge way for opening opportunities and different ideas and possibilities that we hadn't necessarily thought of before because it opens a new story or a new way of thinking. So there's a lot of power that happens um, when we have art merging with, with um, the public good and how we can change perception. Um, below, you'll see a couple images. So Melanie Stimmel also ran workshops through MMSD of how are we fusing um, science and art. So she was in science classes help with how are we applying art technique to understanding and learning science and also representing science for, for students of how they can um, expand art um, and their the practice of art um, in different fields. And um, it was it was a hit. We also had them um, coloring pages of a periodic table that you see a young boy is coloring in there. Um, so this is another opportunity. So we had applications open. So if you're a muralist or a public artist, we're expanding. So our goal for Science of Street Art is that it won't necessarily just always be murals. It could be sculptural work. It could also be a performance. So different ways that we can start to expand and include more arts um, within this. And then also um, artists who are about public practice. How are you forming workshops and creating community art? There's opportunities for folks to apply and um, it's paid. Um, paid work to collaborate and create um, organic ways that we can have STEAM workshops. So moving to a couple um, folks that I'm going to highlight here within this mural just to give some of that science art fusion and what went into this. Um, there was a bunch of people that were um, we were taking a look at of who we wanted to represent this mural and we couldn't represent all the people we wanted to. So our goal was how can we hit all the different fields and um, highlight stories that introduce you to the science and then also um, introduce you to people. So then you can expand and go farther into um, into the work and the people and learn more about uh, more about others that are in these fields. Um, so with that, we have a goal of starting to overlay in the next couple of years virtual reality so that you can actually look at the murals. And this is a part of that PBS framework. You can click different aspects of the mural and learn about the people. You can learn about the art. Um, Melanie Simmel does 3D work. So some of the art that you see within that mural that we just showed is 3D um, in terms of when you stand in a different area. If you take a picture, it looks like the mural is reaching out to you and you're interacting with the mural. So learning about that process. So different ways that we're fusing those practices so you can learn about STEAM and all the different um, practices of STEAM. 
within this mural. Um, I'm going to highlight just two people here and then we're going to um, go into one other person that was represented in a different science art fusion um, video that was created through BBC to show a different way that science art fusion works. So we have um, Susan here. And Susan broke through Victorian era gender stereotypes to become the first Omaha and First Nations person to earn a medical degree in the US. A lot of folks don't realize that this is before women had the right to vote. So huge, you know, huge change in what she did um, and who, you know, what her story is. So I'll put a link um, so that you can learn a little bit about all of the people within this mural through the PBS format. So I'll send that to Megan so that that'll be available um, post this meeting. So you can see some videos about all of these different individuals. The second person I pulled out here is Bill Campbell. And the reason why is just a shout out to UW-Madison because he's an alum. He's um, also won a Nobel Prize um, that was shared for the development, um, for development of a drug. So, this particular photo um, that you'll see, which is with President um, Obama, is a picture that actually my, um, so the, the head of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, her name is Joe Handelsman, she used to be a science advisor during the Obama administration. And so she was there when, um, when, when uh, Bill was received by the president and took this picture. And um, it was, uh, it was this really nice, neat um, exchange with Bill and um, President Obama, where President Obama was sharing a little bit of the science of what how he understood what Bill's Nobel Prize was about. So it was a really neat way of just this organic conversation between the president and Bill about um, the work that he had done that had earned him that prize and um, just how how um, to to you know we can have this really neat experience and um, what Bill had done, which had really changed the world and had served to help um, a lot of communities with his discoveries. And another person that is represented in the mural is Mary Anning. And so I wanted to just give a different example of science art fusion work through a video that BBC has done. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and then I'm gonna jump on so we can share this one video that's short. So you can see um, how an animation science art fusion looks because there's a lot of different science art fusion that is out there um, that's being created. Let's see. All right. Are you seeing the YouTube video? Yeah, no, yes. Mary Anning, the woman who helped discover dinosaurs. Mary Anning was born into a poor family in Lyme Regis on the south coast of England in 1799. As a child, she loved strolling across the beach and cliffs with her father. He was a cabinet maker who earned extra money by searching for fossils. He taught Mary everything he knew about them. They sold the fossils to tourists on a stall outside their house. But one night, tragedy struck. While walking over the cliffs, her father slipped and fell. His injuries were serious. Weakened from the fall, he died soon after from tuberculosis. His death left the family devastated and in great debt. Their lives became a struggle for survival. To help make ends meet, Mary continued her father's fossil business without him. One day, Mary's brother spotted an unusual skull in the cliffs. Twelve-year-old Mary searched relentlessly for the rest of the fossilized bones and dug them out. She had found the skeleton of a prehistoric reptile, the ichthyosaur. The bizarre looking creature was half fish, half lizard. Her discovery was evidence of a highly controversial theory at the time, extinction. Many Christians were shocked and confused as to why God would let a species die out. Mary was noticed by educated geologists who started to come to her for advice. Later, aged 22, Mary discovered the first plesiosaur skeleton. Experts thought her new find was a fake, but eventually she was proven right. Women weren't accepted in the geological society in Mary's time, so she wasn't properly credited for her groundbreaking discoveries. Some men even gave lectures introducing her new finds without any mention of the woman who had discovered them. But Mary remained determined. She saved up for a shop to sell her fossils and continued searching for ancient Jurassic creatures. 
She studied the rocks so carefully that she could even spot coprolites, lumps of fossilized poo. Despite all of this, she was still not well respected in the local community and remained very poor. Things got worse. Her beloved dog, Trey, was killed in a landslide and she became sick with breast cancer. The medicine she was given made her wobbly. The locals sneered at her, calling her a drunk. Sadly, Mary Anning died aged just 47 in 1846. Only on her deathbed did she begin to get the respect she deserved. The Geological Society of London made her an honorary member and began to write about her life's achievements. Now her outstanding contribution to paleontology is fully recognised and she is a celebrated woman of science. It's often said that the famous tongue twister, She Sells Seashells on the Seashore, was based on the life of Mary Annie. But it's hard to say for sure. The truth is buried in the sands of time. So as you saw in that example, they actually used sands from the beach that she collected, um, collected her fossils to create that really neat, uh, that really neat film and story about her. And so um, that's a great example of another type of science art fusion. Um, and other examples that are out there is that um, folks have made um, periodic table quilts. Um, so there's lots, you know, lots of different ways you have, um, you know, this physical traditional public art where you think of mural sculptures, but um, there's also quilting that has happened. Um, people making different kinds of animations. There's also um, drawing, there's um, events and activities. So there's lots of different ways that science art fusion can take form. Um, and it's really up to the artist of, you know, how, how, they, how they're utilizing the craft to tell the story of science. Sometimes um, also science art fusion can be the science behind the art of um, different kinds of way that art are created or some of the chemicals that are used. There's lots of different ways that that happens. Um, and so I'm being mindful of the time here. So I'm gonna um, cruise through some of these, but this is an example of our periodic table mural that's over at the Meadowood Shopping Center. And the science behind this is that you see the chitin molecule and it goes through and it talks about how it's a part of a molecular structure that creates this ladder-like um, shape that then becomes the scales of the wing of a butterfly and how that creates this iridescence. So that's a way of how the, how the art is breaking down the science concept that was created by uh, Peter Crisco and Mario Fergozo, two artists um, with our chemistry professors, Desiree and um, John from the Department of Chemistry. We also have our astrophysics mural, and um, this is a focus of looking at black holes. Um, so what we do is we have artists meet with the, the scientists and kind of look at what are the research interests, what are the artists interested in, and what do they want to highlight, um, and then having the artists um, utilize the, the scientists' research, research um, and different areas of specialty. So one of our scientists, Sebastian Hines, he focuses on black holes. And so what he was talking about was that black holes, they're the brightest things in the universe and that they release enormous amounts of energy that affect our environment. So how could we represent in this mural um, our, our, our space, um, and these different things that are happening um, just, you know, just without a reach in, in the universe. So um, I have a couple of different area elements highlighted here of the science art fusion concepts. I'm going to highlight two of them that are in this slide. One is the origin of elements. Um, there's that famous quote by um, Carl Sagan that says, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were all made from the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And so how could we represent this within a mural? And so we went through and we actually have a mini periodic table here that color codes some of what we um, think created these elements. So some of the different kinds of star explosions that created the elements that we have um, that make us up and our surroundings. So really looking at how, you know, how that formed and how it was a part of when we're looking up the skies. We also have Einstein's field equation in here, um, which is an equation that's wrapped around the black hole at the very top of the design um, and is really looking at the law of gravitation and its relation to other forces of nature. So it um, helps explain um, what, what a black hole is and how it works. 
So um, one of the fun facts about it is that if you think about, um, and BBC has written about this, there's a couple articles, but if an object were to get stuck in a black hole um, at the event horizon, gravity would compress the object and horizontally stretch the object. Um, vertically, just like a noodle. So they call it spaghettification, which is a fun word. Um, so that's um, a little bit of facts of how some of these equations are in this mural and what they're representing. We also have here um, our, this is our big data precision medicine mural. And it's really focusing and nucleating on the idea of what is precision medicine. And it's this concept, um, what precision medicine is, is it's really important because it's starting to unpack that illness, so um, conditions like cancer or heart disease, isn't necessarily going to be the same for each person. And that also means different kinds of medicine, different kinds of treatments. So how are we amplifying that work and making sure that we're having equity within medicine, that we're creating treatments that are going to help everyone? Um, so this was a mural that was done over um, by Luna's Groceries. Um, and it was really working with Luna's too and community of how do we want to re represent an um, individual and um, the focus was on women here for a couple different reasons. We wanted this to be a woman of color, representative of the community, um, also to highlight women because this was a unique mural where it was three, um, that the scientists that were a part of this and the artists were all women. And so that's very unique for the fields. Um, our artist artifacts um, is a street artist and you know, being a, a female street artist and what that means. And then also our scientists who um, are in fields that have traditionally been dominated by, by men. Um, our molecular structure mural, this was our last mural to go up and um, it was an adventure. Um, we have this mural that was led by Ingrid Kallick and um, Peter Crisco. It is the one mural that's on Polytab and Dama was amazing and collaborated with us to get this on site um, because we have some unique city regulations that because this was a brick building, it had to be done on Polytab. And so we had to change scope of how we um, were doing the process of this mural. Um, and a little bit of the science behind this mural you can see is that um, there's lots of different science in this one. It's very rich with a lot of hidden different ideas, but one of the main concepts throughout this mural was water. And it was a mural that was put on um, pumping station eight of the Madison Metropolitan Sewerage District right next to Wright Middle School. And so it was a goal of how are we talking about water and the importance of water and especially what they do for community of um, you know, taking our water waste, cleaning it and making, you know, making sure that when it goes back into our lakes and streams that go down to the south, um, how, you know, how are you making sure it's clean water um, so that we're protecting as much water as possible? This represents the different phases um, that you have of water. So you have the gas state, the liquid state, the solid state, um, and the different kinds of patterning that happen um, between those stages and the molecular structure. So you can see that the gas state, those molecules are far apart. And in the liquid state, they're together, but they're loose. Um, so they're able to move and the solid state is very rigid and structured. And that's where you get this unique um, patterning where you see there's one, two, three, four, five, six sides. That's, that, that's the, the shape that it takes when it goes into a solid state. And that's why you have those six sided um, snowflakes because it has to do with that molecular structure. So just really neat ways of how, um, how structure is formed within a, within a molecule when they're forming together for these different phases. And the last program that I'm going to talk about is Science to Script, which is um, the program that is pairing writers um, with scientists that are interested in putting science in their stories. So this can be script writers, it can be um, spoken word, it can be um, people that are playwrights. So it's lots of different ways of what it means to tell stories. Um, the origin of Science to Script um, started with Joe Handelsman, the executive director of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery when she was working um, at the White House and when Hidden Figures was coming out. There's a lot of meetings that happened between the Hidden Figures um, filmmaking leaders and actors with the White House and how it really started to come about of how are we representing science responsibly within mass media and how are we creating moments that we can acknowledge the rich and diverse history that we have and also be responsible at how we're role modeling within mass media. So it started from a film 
film um, base, but we've really expanded it. So it's not just about film. Um, and so what we do here is we have a lot of different things other than the residency. Um, we also have um, what we call speed sciencing, which is open to the public and um, all different kinds of writers of learning about different science. You're getting to sample different um, science, with sci um, science from scientists at UW. And if there's an interest in um, a different kind of science topic that you'd like to explore, we can help pair them with you. And depending on the kind of project, it's something that we can talk about and then look at potential grants in the future that we could collaborate and write on together to get some funding for folks that would like to, to have a story um, that they're working on and committed to and have some funds. We also do um, different kinds of screenings that we're working on. You'll see these three little circles here um, representing hidden figures scientists in Apollo 13, which we recently showed at the, showed at the Science Festival um, at the Mallard Stadium. Um, we also have different kinds of panel discussions. So um, this last month, we had a conversation with special effects experts that are um, Academy and Oscar nominated that worked on um, the film's hidden figure in Apollo 13 and to talk about the science that goes into their work, their work of storytelling. So really neat ways of how we're bringing some of that industry here and talking about science and creating opportunities um, for artists and scientists to collaborate. And then also for artists from different areas of the country coming so that there can be a neat network for our local artists. In these areas. All right, in residence right now, we have Michael Graff, who is working on a um, environmental thriller. Um, he's going to be carrying on his um, residency into, um, he's going to be carrying it on um, into next spring um, due to COVID. But this is an opportunity for if folks want to get really a deep dive into um, a particular story that they're working on and want to shadow different scientists in the labs, um, this is a way to do that. Of course, we've had a hybrid with COVID. Um, COVID-19, where this is mainly done virtually at this point, but um, it's something that we have available through Science's Script. And so what does this mean for the artist business? Um, this is a way where we have lots of opportunities. So from what I've talked about, if you're interested and you're a public artist that would like to um, apply um, to do public art, we're gonna be opening that up and reviewing applications for summer. Um, we also have opportunities within that. If you are um, an artist that likes to focus on community work or creating activities or fostering different kinds of community-based activities, we have funding for that as well. Um, and then of course the writer in residence and different um, kinds of workshops that we have available that are free of charge. Um, th there's also opportunities for co-grant writing and fostering networks with scientists that can lead to paid opportunities in the future. Um, so I'm gonna briefly go through this so that we can get to the nitty gritty of this. Um, but I brought up here the National Endowment for the Arts, which is that national granting organization that um, a lot of artists have heard about or applied to. So one of the equivalents, because there's a few for the sciences is the National Science Foundation. And um, the National Science Foundation is one of the places that for WID, we apply to our researchers um, in order to get grants for that research. And um, this National Science Foundation is similar to federal agency. It was created in Congress in 1950. And um, the goal of it is to promote the progress of science um, to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare um, of our country, and then also secure the national defense. So those are a couple of the priorities that go into the Science Foundation. Doesn't seem a lot connected to art, but this is, this is where it's connected. Um, so there's areas in the National Science Foundation grants that are called broader impacts, and they also have um, a focus on informal learning. So broader impacts is a section of the NSF that um, has to do with the potential for someone's research to benefit society and contribute to the achievement of desired society outcomes. So in that, some of the priorities they have is that you're advancing the discovery and understanding um, of science while promoting teaching and training and learning in diverse ways, and then also broadening the participation of underrepresented groups. And this has been a challenge with the sciences because we're approaching it from this very rigid structure. And so that's where artistic um, STEAM opportunities become an interest for funding through these organizations. So broader impacts is a part that's, that's included in um, scientist grants. So this is where if they wanna do an activity, there's opportunity for funding if they wanna partner with an artist that it can pay an artist to do some work um, through a broader impacts activity that's based on the research. Informal learning are these larger grants. So it's something that we're working on for science to street art where it's larger funding that creates um, 
funding for a program over several years to be able to support whatever that, you know, whatever that proposal is. And what we're really focusing on and that there's an interest in is innovations. And so STEAM can be an innovation within informal learning and how you're having opportunities for um, what they call informal learning, which is how are people learning about science not in the classroom? So these are some of the grants that are available and ways that then you can partner for co-collaboration and plug into the money that they have um, that a scientist might have already with a grant um, or future grants and ways that then artists can help um, be a part of those grants, but then it's a way of collaborating on those grants so there's built-in funding for them if the grant were to be, um, the grant were to move forward. And so this is something that um, I know there's some amazing um, workshops that have already happened on um, different kinds of fundraising and grant work. So I'm just going to be pretty brief here. And if you're interested in learning more, please reach out to me. But whenever you're talking about a grant, it's the same way. Um, artists, we really should um, think of ourselves, and this is me thinking back as when I was um, actively doing acting, um, I was a performer. We are a business. We as an individual have to think of ourselves as a business and have to um, engage in learning more about what it means to be entrepreneurial because we are entrepreneurial. We're creative and that's like in essence what it is. Um, so a business model canvas is so important. And this one is actually from the business model canvas book. Um, but this is a great way to look at going through the different aspects of a business model canvas and applying it to who you are um, as a person. What are your strengths? What are your key partners? What is your outcomes? What is that value that you're bringing and your goals and your vision? Um, and this is also the essence of a grant. If you can get this information, this is the text that guides you in a successful grant. So that's just the one thing I wanted to note is that really with any grant, I always think about a business model canvas because it really does create a good strong guideline for what you need for that successful writing approach. And um, with that, there's a lot of opportunities out there. This is just kind of a sampling of different kinds of science art fusion work that's similar to science and street art that's been happening um, in the last year. So there's a lot of fundraising happening. There's a lot of interest, especially with COVID-19. You're seeing a lot of artists responding um, because when we have a lot of challenges, artists are often the some of the first responders of, you know, how are we, how are we responding to this and then creating moments of um, hope and clarity within really challenging situations like we have with COVID-19. So there's a lot of opportunity if you're interested in doing science art fusion work and having that be a part of your art business and your art practice. Um, there's ways to get funding both um, with science collaborators and then also within the community because it's a, quite a timely, um, timely fusion. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. We know that we're going to end in a minute, but I'm happy to stay a little bit longer if people have any. much that was such an informative um presentation so interesting to see how you know with the work behind uh, the scenes at wid and actually on the scenes right on the street <laughs> the work that's being done um it's such a valuable resource in our community and such a great way to um, bridge those um communities and really expand um so thank you so much uh does anybody have any questions you're welcome to unmute uh if you'd like or you can pop something in the chat um, and we will share Ginger Ann's information. So if this has inspired you to um, participate or reach out to the WID and um, share some ideas, uh, that would be really exciting. We'd love to uh, see that outcome. So well, and I was really excited to see where those murals are. So I can't wait to go check them out. <laughs> um, I did drop, uh, as Ginger Ann was talking, I did drop in the chat links to um, to a number of the resources that she was talking about. And we can certainly share those as well um, after the fact. So uh, we are putting those out there. Um, and it definitely looks like uh, you're gonna get some contacts after the fact. So we'll make sure we share that. And when we post this on YouTube, we'll uh, put the links there. Um, but in honor of our time, and we know that everyone's got a lot on their plate, I wanna say thank you for being here tonight. And thanks to uh, Dane Arts for supporting uh, these Workshop Wednesdays. We've been doing them since uh, about February, and tonight happens to be our last one on the schedule. So we do have one more sort of time in review next, I'm sorry, the 18th of November at seven o'clock right here on Zoom, Facebook Live, and we'll be sharing it. But we're gonna do a year in review panel with our uh, presenters from this year. 
as well as looking ahead to how valuable was this to our artists and our art community? What kinds of things would you like to see in the future and how can Dane Arts and um, the art crew and the art people, everybody out there being creative, what we can do to all support each other. So um, with that, I thank you all for being here this evening and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Don't uh, hesitate to visit the Dane Arts website and sign up for their newsletter. Um, that will keep you up to date on all of these things. And I'm sure the WID uh, can share some information and we'll get it out there that way as well. So thank you all very much. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here. And thank you, Megan, for having me.